for uh, across Canada uh, in a number of provinces and, and uh, most recently last year uh, expanded into the United States. That is, for, for me, you know, we have been watching psychedelics come on in terms of especially mental health treatment for probably the last decade. Mm -hmm. And to see the commercial interest in it now, I think is probably the last peg in what we know <laughs> is going to be all our gold rush, right? Mm -hmm. Why is it so promising, Peyton? You know, I, th I think it's a couple of things. Um, I, I think as as everybody is, is very well aware, um, we're we're in a very much a, 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 a the very very tip of a significant crisis in regards to mental health, um, and with that we haven't seen any innovation in mental health treatment in you know fifty years, um, albeit certainly you know different um, revived practices in regards to mental health, and I think psychedelics are one of those. You know, it's it's kind of it's a little bit strange sometimes to say um, this is new or innovative because it's actually sort of the the original um, <laughs> mental health treatment uh, that that we're aware of. Um, but I think I think with that, you know, the resurgence uh, of research and the clinical data, um, you know, the I think Maps, who we've been fortunate enough to work with for a number of years now, and and for anybody who doesn't know. Um, MAPS is really the reason why any of us who are working with psychedelics are here. Um, yeah. They've been moving MDMA through uh, FDA clinical trials for about 35 years now. And, you know, their most recent data um, showed MDMA for treatment resistant post-traumatic stress disorder, which are folks who have tried every other treatment. Um, over 80% of participants uh, saw a significant clinical reduction in their symptoms and 67% actually no longer met the PTSD criteria after mm. three treatments. Wow. Um, there's nothing, I mean, we, we don't have anything that even comes close to comparing to that. And, and I think with that, from a stigma standpoint as well, um, I, I think people's minds have changed a lot in regards mm. to psychedelics. And I think, you know, it's, it's bizarre bizarre to me in a way it seems like anybody you talk to is microdosing or is going on some retreat or is doing something like that and, and that's it's wonderful to see psychedelics used with that intention um but for us at numinous also we can't underscore the importance of the preparation work the integration work um all that really needs to be wrapped around a psychedelic therapy experience in order for it to really be effective. I want to just go back a little bit because I'm I'm really interested in the research and how you have partnered with some of the teaching institutions and the labs that are actually doing the work. So give us a little primer on that, especially for sure. MDMA. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, maybe a little bit for, for why Numinous even exists, um, you know, through my own experience with with having my life saved with psychedelics um when i came out of that experience it was originally just trying to figure out how i could give back to something that saved my life i never planned on quitting my job and starting a company and doing everything that we've done but um as i was starting to have those conversations with people um you know that it was primarily not for profit and academic groups and the conversation was just how, how can i help what what mm. what needs to happen here um to give people an experience like the experience that i was fortunate enough to have and the same thing it didn't matter if i was talking to maps or academic groups the same thing just kept being um infrastructure there was nobody building the other side of what happens when these drugs are approved. And mm -hmm. so that really for us has, has been the focus. And it's been, you know, we, we have full clinical trial um, site management organization capabilities. So we do, we're the sites for a number of clinical trials, including the MDMA work with MAPS, uh, LSD clinical trials, psilocybin clinical trials, but we also are able to, um, you know, see what's happening in research and build a clinical model based off of what we're seeing. So we kind of get a, a look into the future a little bit um, with what's coming. And, and that's really been, that's been our focus. Tell me more about the personal experience where you describe psychedelics as saving your life. Yeah, sure. Um, I, 
I suffered with severe chronic pain uh, essentially since birth. And I grew up uh, in a household that, that struggled with substance abuse. And my mom uh, got sober when, when I was about 12. And, you know, she came home and the first thing she said to me was, you know, I'm very sorry for what's happened. And um, you might want to start talking to somebody because there's going to be some stuff that that eventually will come up in your life. And I took that very seriously because of my chronic pain and kind of went on this mental health and physical health crusade um, whereby I was trying every single mental health treatment, physical health treatment, anything that I could do to alleviate my chronic pain. Um, and it was hugely transformational for me, but my chronic pain symptoms just couldn't get any better. And, uh, and I got myself to a point where I was being hospitalized about three times a week and was really out of options and kind of in this existential crisis almost of like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I've committed everything to this path and I'm still this ill maybe I'm actually not supposed to be here. Um, maybe I'm, I'm, maybe there's a message I'm not getting here. And so, um, psychedelics were really a last ditch for me. And, um, you know, again, with someone who came from a, a household that struggled with substance abuse, I'd never had a psychedelic experience before. I always kind of was like the anti recreational drug guy. Um, but with that, you know, turn to, and I, and I, I don't want to paint the picture of a panacea because I usually say this is when the work actually started, but, mm. um, I ended up turning to ayahuasca and, um, one week with ayahuasca and I never had any chronic pain symptoms ever again. And, um, it was, you know, I always preface with, I would say that the system that was uh holding that pain is still mm. very much there and intact but that mm. the it's maybe filled with a different fuel than it was was before so um i owe i owe a lot of my life and and why i'm here to to that experience and i think it was so um lasting and impactful for me because of how much mental health experience i had and how many tools i had in my toolbox to then go like, oh, I, I know what to do with this. Mm -hmm. I, I've got practices and tools that I can use to to apply this to my day-to-day -day life. I, I really like what you have said because I think so many people, when they talk about mental health, you know, how everyone walks around thinking the head is devoid of the body, they really dismiss people's physical pain. And it's mm -hmm. so often tied up, especially in chronic fatigue, in severe depression, um, that people feel immense chronic physical pain that they can't get doctors, a lot of doctors to even pay attention to. So I so appreciate you sharing that story because mm. I think somebody out there might go, oh my God, that's me. I have all this trauma, all this yeah. holding, all this rigidity, and I haven't ever put the two together. It's really yeah. cool. Thank really you. Cool. Yeah. Well, and, and I think important with that too is, you know, we have these mental health indications that we associate with a, a mental health indication, right? right? Depression, anxiety. How do people explain those things? Right. Oh, I, I feel down. Right. I feel anxious. So mm -hmm. while it's, it's maybe associated with a, a, a mental or a brain challenge, when we're explaining these things, it's, we're telling people we're saying how it feels in our bodies. And um, I think, you know, I, I think it, to go back to the research as well, you know, there's psychedelics being researched for so many different indications and they seem to be effective for so many different indications because I think what they do is they, and um, we're fortunate enough, Dr. Gabor Mate, who, who people might know is really, you know, a person who very, very, very early in Numinous was um, was a huge part of why we are today and, and has been an advisor to me. But um, but I think why all these psychedelics are being uh, effective for so many indications is because we're getting to the underlying root cause of why these challenges exist, which is trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're reframing also the definition of trauma for people. I think when a lot of people think about trauma, they think about war veterans or first responders yeah. trauma is just any event that's happened in your life that has led to some kind of negative outcome and that mm -hmm. can certainly be you know something severe but it can also be 
your dog dying when you're sick mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. six years old. It can be, you know, any of those things. And our nervous systems hold that imprinting and, and they hold that, that experience. Mm -hmm. And then our minds try and figure out, you know, how is the best way to keep us safe through that experience? Yeah. I, I think it's um, interesting. I just spent a lot of time exploring your side and all of the different ways that you're both training integration experts, that you have the clinic so that people can come in, that they're led through this experience. And then you have someone who's skilled to work through it with them. But how are you dealing with the regulatory landscape, especially in North America, that is so checkered and so much of this is still underground? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. Um, the The effort has always been, how do we make this as accessible for people as possible? And, you know, the word accessibility gets thrown a lot around a lot these days. And I think that that accessibility means a lot of different things. It means um, financial accessibility. It means legal accessibility. But it also means, you know, from a training standpoint, um, accessibility for diverse groups of people, someone mm -hmm. who's dealing with um, you know, sexual abuse trauma or um, cultural trauma, you know, th those there's nuances there that, you know, you need training and people who can hold people through those experiences. Um, from a regulatory standpoint in particular, um, you know, we've been fortunate enough, especially up in, we were home-based in, in Vancouver, Canada. And um, one of the, the efforts that we helped change was there's a a program up in Canada called the Special Access Drug Program. And it's a program that is offered to uh, Canadians uh, who need access to drugs or treatments that have not completed the clinical trial process, but have shown therapeutic benefit. And mm. psychedelics were previously restricted from being able to apply, be applied for that program. Um, we, we worked with Health Canada for a number of years uh, to help change and and have now changed that program. So wow. un, any Canadian can apply and and uh, hopefully get approved and get access to that therapy. But, you know, the thing that we've felt from regulators, and this is regardless of whether it's in Canada or in the United States, um, is there's a lot of support for this. And I think it's because the research is, is showing it. And I think, you know, with that as well, um, from a safety profile standpoint, you know, especially with psilocybin and LSD, some of the more naturally derived psychedelics, there's actually no lethal dose. They're actually mm -hmm. extremely safe drugs. Meanwhile, um, you know, I think now the, the third highest reason why people end up in the emergency room is complications with mental health medications. Yeah. So um, there's, there's a, a recognition there and a shift. And I think, you know, all coupled with the fact that it's 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 very very well known um that this mental health crisis is significant and not going away you know um i i guess i would have to to challenge the idea that there's no downside because there are those outlying cases where people have really horrible trips yes uh, attempt self-harm do things that are crazy do things yeah that aren't in a contained environment. And so we do know that there's some, you know, killer doses that actually are harmful. Mm -hmm. So how is your company working to try to find that sweet spot of what yeah. is the right amount of drug in each of these drugs? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, a great question. And, and um, to, to agree with you in regards to, there's no, from a, a toxicity standpoint, there's right. no, there's no toxic dose. There's no right. lethal from a, um, a toxicity standpoint. Um, but from a set and setting standpoint, I mean, that's, that I think is, is like any, you know, any substance um, there's, there's certainly a harmful, there's certainly harm that can be caused. And mm -hmm. I think with psychedelics, um, you know, the way we refer to them is, you know, uh, uh, they're tools and a hammer can be used to build a house or a hammer can be used to hit yourself in the hand with, mm -hmm. um, really depends on who's, who's managing it. And, you know, there's, there's this conversation around bad trips. And I would argue what, what I, what I think there's more of is, is very bad set and settings and, and b very bad environments that people end up in that, you know, inevitably will cause harm. And, mm -hmm. And I think for us, that's how we've really navigated that is, is through the research. We're, we're very clear in regards to what dosing is, but more importantly, 
the the training and stringency of the environments that we create um, are are really where our focus is and and have been from the very beginning and and our feeling around this is you know human human beings are going to be human beings and you're seeing a huge amount of uh excitement encouragement and use of psychedelic compounds and unfortunately there are going to be bad stories there are going to be things that happen and what we've always looked to build is you know yes there's positive momentum and that's great but how do we build something that lasts beyond some of those stories that happen and and keep a a level of rigor and intentionality um, that can supersede that because the last thing that we want is to fall into another situation that we ran into in the in the sixties and seventies where you know unfortunately the the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater right. um, and uh, and again you know at a time where we really really need these treatments. Yeah, I, I'm very interested for um, for the use of ketamine uh, just because you know it is derived from a party drug. It is mm-hmm. like it has that incredible rush of the those feel good chemicals and then i have heard several people say that when the ketamine leaves your body you're left really quite down so how are people prepared for that feeling yeah. you know dopamine serotonin it's all been washed out for mm-hmm. a bit mm-hmm. um how do you prepare people for the eventuality that you actually need to do that work while the drug is in your system yeah. monitor it really carefully, make sure that you don't, you know, go full stop mm-hmm. that you taper down. Mm-hmm. It it does seem like there's the potential for abuse for people who have a propensity toward drug addiction. For sure. And, and in particular with ketamine, um, yeah. you know, th- this might sound counterintuitive, but you know, ketamine actually is, is the only psychedelic compound that we we have a proof of of potential for abuse. Uh, wow. Certainly, anybody can abuse anything, but ketamine in particular, um, because of the disassociative effects that it yeah. has, um, you know, that relief can can certainly turn into dependence, and yeah. that is is why education is so imperative. Um, mm-hmm. You know, to be totally honest, it's it's been interesting to watch uh, and be a part of. You know, up in Canada, our regulations around ketamine are quite more stringent. Mm-hmm. Um, through COVID, you watch the sort of ketamine landscape in the United States go kind of crazy. And um, and a part of that was due to actually some regulation change that were supposed to be temporary regulation changes where scheduled uh, drugs previously when you needed a prescription for for a drug that was scheduled, you had to go in person and you had to sit with a, a referring physician through COVID, that all got to shift to be virtual. And you started to wow. see these virtual ketamine models, which we've very much steered away from. And we want everybody to get access to healing and, and safe treatment. Um, but to be honest, you know, we've seen a lot of bad practices and, and we have um, we we sort of call them the, the ketamine refugees, but we have a huge amount of people who come to our clinics in the United States who have had really challenging experiences with virtual ketamine models. They see the benefit. They, they see how this can be really useful. But, you know, you, you wouldn't do a, a do it at home brain surgery. Right. Um, yeah. And so to, to just sort of just go like, here's your here's your here's your psychedelic, you know, best of luck to you. Um, I, I think we have to be extremely cautious, extremely mm-hmm. cautious. And I would love to see more standards put in place from the regulators in regards to ketamine. And I think that that's coming, um, you know, to talk just, you know, MDMA, which is is sort of the next uh, FDA approved drug um, through MAPS. You know, it's interesting from a, a cultural perspective, everybody associates MDMA with ecstasy and, and it being a party drug. But MDMA was actually originally synthesized as a psychotherapy tool. Mm -hmm. And there were hundreds and thousands of psychotherapy sessions that happened with MDMA in the United States before it made its way into a, it was a Dallas nightclub that it made its way into and it became a party drug and then scheduled. So Mm -hmm. there's this kind of, you know, the, the debunking of, of that. And, and I think back to your point around how do you prepare people for, you know, this, it's such a peak experience that these experiences are. And even just the coming back to, oh, that was, you know, maybe very challenging, also maybe very blissful. And now I'm back to, 
you know, regularly scheduled programming. Um, <laughs> which could be the problem after all, right? <laughs> which, <laughs> a, bad job, a bad girlfriend, uh, a, a bad yeah. outlook, you know, I mean, all of those things. I, I really loved your point about how important um, talk therapy is along with it, because yeah. so many people that want the peak experience forget you actually do have to go back to your apartment and pay rent you know mm -hmm. it's like those are the things that contribute to depression and anxiety yeah so how are we going to deal with the real life concerns that people have yeah and and that's that's such a crucial point and you see this a lot in the psychic you know sort of the underground psychedelic communities where there's a little bit of this um call it i would call it like spiritual materialism where it's you know, I'm, I'm going to do my 200th ayahuasca ceremony and yada, yada, mm -hmm. yada. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. you know, I can't hold a relationship to save my life and I'm not sure where my car keys yeah. are. Yeah. Um, the, you know, these are tools to help improve your day-to-day -day life. It's mm -hmm. not a, an escape. Um, it's, it's, it's an intervention to allow you to see, you know, how incredible day-to-day -day life really can be. I want to just briefly, if you could, so how do you decide which drug is more appropriate for a person based on mm -hmm. their history of trauma, based on whatever medical illness they're dealing with, especially in terms of mental illness, and then what their risk tolerance is for a peak experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, obviously, for right now, ketamine is the only legal psychedelic that we have outside of, of clinical trials. But I think, you know, as, as we move towards more of these drugs coming online, whether it's psilocybin, MDMA, you know, that's really, I think, why research is, is so crucial. Um, mm -hmm. I think, and I think as a part of that, as an intervention, you know, that the someone who has severe trauma and PTSD, you know, the, the psilocybin experience might just be way too overwhelming for somebody. Yeah. And so yeah. something like MDMA with it, with something that is, uh, very, you know, MDMA is, is very therapy intensive. It's, it's, there's a lot of support as is, as is the psilocybin protocol. But, but I think as, as we move, you know, more and more into, uh, having more of that research data, that's, that I think will be very, very crucial. Um, you know, for ketamine, we have a number of different ketamine products or protocols that we offer people, depending on what they're, um, you know, what they're, what they're coming to see us for. And, uh, We've been fortunate enough to be working with ketamine for about 10 years now. Wow, that's amazing. So you had this first peak experience with ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And then throughout your life, have you felt the need to do a tune-up, to go back in, to see what's happening with the rest of these psychedelics so you can talk about mm -hmm. it from experience? That's a that's a very good question. Um, I I did, I don't want to say what not to do, but yeah. but I'm but I've certainly I sort of went on, I would, I would almost call it like a psychedelic crusade of really trying. And it, and a part of it was just trying to learn. Uh, I felt that there was no way that I could lead an organization like Numinous without really understanding, you know, what these things are. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I've been fortunate enough to, to go through a, a number of different experiences with pretty much all of the psychedelic compounds with really, um, you know, exceptional, exceptional practitioners and, and people who have, have guided and steered me through that. I've done lots of therapist training as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for anybody that is, you know, running an organization or, or trying to build something, it's ex not only is it extremely important to have these experiences, but just to get the t-shirt isn't enough. You, you've got to live that lifestyle um, because ultimately you have to know and understand what the person who's coming through your door is and, mm -hmm. and also, you know, what the therapists are going through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah. You know, the heavy lifting is, is very, very much felt and done by the practitioners. And it is, it is hugely demanding work. Um, and, and nobody needs more support than the practitioners do. Mm. Given that Oregon is the first state in North America to have legalized uh, the use of psilocybin, do you expect to see Numinous in Oregon soon? 
We do. Um, I, you know, we've, we've been keeping a very, very close eye on what's happening there. I, from a regulatory perspective, I think there's still a, a little bit to figure out there mm. still. Um, and so we, we definitely see ourselves expanding. We, we would love to be all over the United States and Canada. Um, right now, the thing that we've focused on is, is how do we create a model that is very scalable, replicatable, um, but still accessible for people. Um, mm. Insurance is a, is a huge, huge, huge part of yeah. this conversation. And um, we're, I, I think we're the largest insurance reimbursed ketamine provider in the country. We get about 80% of our ketamine services are covered under insurance. Wow. So, you know, I, I think while, while certainly we've sort of been, been at the very beginning of, of this sort of industry of psychedelics, um, but we're, we're certainly also not out to just rush into whatever next jurisdiction is, is making some regulatory change. We want to make sure that we can expand in a meaningful way. Peyton Nyquist, what a great conversation. I'm really happy we connected and congratulations to Numinous. I'm a huge supporter of this effort. I, I think if you read anything about my backstory, if these kind of treatments had been available to my late husband, he might still be here with us. Mm. So thank you again for your time and attention today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.